Hello YouTube family, it's Miss Dana Ashley. I have been busily created what has turned out to be an over two hour length piece called America Civil War 2.0, but I have decided to release the finale as a standalone piece because, well, I think it's pretty important and I do hope that you learn from and enjoy it. As a part of my final yet very large point in all of this, I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this whole thing this whole final stage of victim oppressor psyop, it's designed for our destruction because the entire premise that has created the current day grievances that you'll see people offering, the asking for reparations. I want you to find by the time you leave this autonomous zone, I want you to give $10 to one African American person from this autonomous zone. So find an African-American person, the white people, I see you. I see every single one of you. And I remember your faces. You find that African-American person and you give them $10. Cash app, Venmo, $10 in your pocket. Do it. That justifies the whole white guilt, white privilege thing, right? It's all based on a lie. The lie being that the United States was built solely on the backs of black slaves who were solely owned and tortured by whites. Allow me to introduce the other side that you never learned in US history class. For it was not only blacks who suffered greatly under the awful tradition of slavery. There were white slaves and there were lots of them. Now, I've been studying this hidden truth in depth. I've looked through the work of suppressed historians and documents through multiple books that I've purchased. Many of them. Okay. Here's a quote from one of the authors of this book that I bought called White Cargo. Now, as we began to uh, investigate this, and we used all, this, all the kind of resources that investigators do, we look at every, every kind of book, every kind of official report, etc., diaries, letters, we realized it was an enormous uh, story. And it was also something which, which refuted one of the great ideas, of, well, one of the, one of the key ideas of the development of slavery, which is that in 1619 slavery began in America with the arrival of 20 and odd Negroes, as they were called, um, sold, according to uh, accounts, by a Dutch captain to planters in England. And this was where slavery began. Well, it wasn't true. Uh, slavery had begun earlier. Uh, children and women had been, and convicts had been sold earlier than that. And although a small number of Africans uh, were subsequently brought to Virginia and sold over the next decades, only very few, only 350 years later, oh, sorry, 20 years later. But meantime, hundreds, thousands of uh, poor whites were being brought in and on various convicts and children, etc. And, and they were being enslaved. Well, after hearing that, you might be wondering, well, why haven't I heard about this? Perhaps that's because Hollywood never saw fit to make a multi-million dollar movie about the topic. If we as a people even knew etymology better, we would have already figured out that the word slave itself comes from the word Slav, as in Eastern European descent. To be fair, all races at one point or another have suffered from slavery in some way, but white slavery specifically has been a huge reality in the history of the world that even Wikipedia notorious for being selective about their histories themselves, have been forced to host an entire page on. This page goes over not hundreds of years of history, but thousands of years of proof of white slavery in the world. For example, well over a million Christian slaves were sold to Muslim masters via the African slave traders. This is the story of the slave trade between Europe and Africa, a tragic tale of coastal villages raided 
and men, women and children carried off into captivity, loaded onto ships, taken to be sold as slaves in another continent and never seeing their homes again. A familiar enough narrative, except that in this case, the villages being depopulated in this way were English, and the slave traders arrived in ships which had sailed from Africa. Long before the British ever became involved in the slave trade, slavers out of Africa were raiding not only the British Isles, but many other European countries. From Iceland to Malta, Ireland to Spain, and Italy to the Netherlands, carrying off white slaves to be sold in the slave markets of Africa. The Barbary pirates were actually after people, white Christians specifically, who could be sold as slaves in Muslim countries. Slavery was an old African tradition and it is not to be wondered at that it flourished on what became known as the Barbary Coast. Of course, everybody knows about Europeans going to Africa and taking the people off into slavery. It's taught in schools. White slavery is not so well known. The Barbary Coast was named after the Berbers who originally lived there and included countries like Algeria, Tunisia and modern-day Morocco. From ports there, Muslims set off to Europe to see if seize as many white Christians as they could for the slave markets of North Africa. The stereotype from establishment history is that of a Muslim slaver herding chained blacks through the desert, when in fact, for 700 years until the fall of Muslim Spain, those being herded were first and foremost notoriously white. The fate of the hundreds of thousands of white slaves sold to the Arabs was described in Spanish texts as atrocima et ferocima, most atrocious and harsh. The men were worked to death as galley slaves. The women, girls, and boys were used as prostitutes. Dr. John Azuma estimates in his 2001 book that slavers in these parts engaged in the incredible heinous practice of castration of both white and black men and boys to bring their highest priced specialty slave called the eunuch to the market. It is thought that six out of 10 men and boys died in this process. Now this was done uh, not only to stop their nature of retaliation, as well to make them best suited for guarding their other favorite slaves, their sex slaves known as a harem, many of which were also white. Now eunuchs have been used for millennia in a variety of cultures. For example, according to author Ronald Siegel in his 2002 book, The Khalifa in Baghdad at the beginning of the 10th century, he had over 7,000 black eunuchs and 4,000 white eunuchs in his palace. I guess their white privilege did not save the white slaves that were children and women and eunuchs the same fate of their black counterparts. We suffered this atrocity together. Another story that we were never told by Hollywood or historians that could have brought us together instead of apart. All over European seas and coasts, the Barbary pirates in the 16th and 17th centuries constantly ransacked ships ran by Europeans where they emptied them out, chained them up, and hauled them off to sell in northern Africa. How extensive was this trade? Was it a trifling affair of a few hundred people here and there? Hardly. The island of Gozo, part of modern Malta, was attacked in July 1551 and the entire population of 5,000 people taken off into slavery. The sack of Baltimore in Ireland gives one good example of what was going on at that time. The entire population was removed. This was a serious problem for Europe, especially in the Mediterranean countries, but also for Britain and even Iceland. Current estimates suggest that the number of Europeans captured and taken to Africa numbered in the millions. Yet we were all taught the romantic and entertaining stories of the pirates, those radical and lovable fellows, but not afraid to walk you off the plank in their search for treasure, right? But our history books, cartoons, and films failed to show us that, in fact, they were deep into the business of the snatching and sale of souls. And white Christians were their favorite variety. European slaves were acquired by these pirates in slave raids on coastal towns from Italy to France, England, Portugal to the Netherlands, even Iceland, and taken to Africa for their sale. 
European men, women, and children were captured to such a devastating extent in these seacoast towns that vast numbers of them were abandoned for fear of this dreaded fate. Now, we all know that America abolished slavery in 1865, right? But how many knew that it wasn't until 1904 that an agreement in Paris regarding the international white slave traffic was pinned? The International Agreement for the Suppression of White Slave Traffic geared in great part again to the white women, little girls, and little boys that were still being commonly sold as sex slaves. Why haven't your women activists told you that story, huh? In the early 1600s, whites, mostly Irish, and African blacks were enslaved together in the sugar plantations in the West Keys in places like Barbados. This West Key Island man's accent, celebration of St. Patrick's Day in song, will make a whole lot more sense when you understand this fact. No me all. The hours of depth in my soul never sounded a noon. Sure, I love the dear silver that shines in your hair and the brow that's all furrowed and wrinkled with care. I kiss the dear fingers so toil worn for me. Oh, God bless you and keep you, Mother McCree. Perhaps you find yourself wondering whatever became of those white slaver pirates. Well, when you consider the fact that President Thomas Jefferson, starting in the year 1800, brought the U.S. Navy back to life for the purpose of one of our country's very first military operations, the Barbary Wars, to stop the pirates' extortion and terror of white enslavement against U.S. merchant ships, and they did so quite successfully, you then must consider that your U.S. history books never told you that. And therefore, you must deeply question everything else they taught you. As for Hollywood, can you even imagine how fantastic a movie could portray this event? It would easily make hundreds of millions of dollars. But movies aren't made merely for money. They're made to reinforce your programming. I think I found the deepest meaning for the phrase whitewashed when I fully realized the depths to which these historical facts have been completely removed from our American and world history classes, as well as establishment academics. Again, I'm talking about the chained up by the neck, traded off as cattle, shipped off, bought and sold, claimed on one's taxes, white slaves in colonial America. David Bryan Davis, writing in the New York Review of Books said, As late as the 14th and 15th centuries, continuing shipments of white slaves flowed from the booming slave markets on the North Black Sea coast. From Barbados to Virginia, colonists showed few scruples about reducing their less fortunate countrymen to a status little different than that of chattel slaves. Now, Random House Dictionary of English Language defines slavery as ownership of a person or persons by another or others. Now, this certainly describes the significant portion of whites brought to the colonies as a greater number of them died than survived while still being bound in servitude. The book, They Were White and They Were Slave, states, White slaves transported to the colonies suffered a staggering loss of life in the 17th and 18th centuries. During the voyage to America, it was customary to keep the white slaves below deck for the entire 9-12 to week journey, chained with 50 others to a board with padlock collars around their necks. Independent investigator A.B. Ellis in the Argosy writes, Concerning the transport of white slaves, the human cargo, many of whom were still tormented by wounds, could not lie down at once without lying on each other. The, quote, dungeon below was darkness, stench, lamentation, disease, and death. Now, I learned through study that unlike the black slaves who were purchased by African slave traders for a significant amount of money, the white slaves were mostly taken at no initial cost. Therefore, slavers apparently were less worried about protecting the survival of their investment. As the book Labor in America, a History describes, Upon arrival in America, white slaves were put up for sale by the ship captains or merchants. Families were often separated under these circumstances when wives and offspring were auctioned off to the highest bidder. As for colonial America, there were some who had signed up for indentured servitude, willingly, 
which we got about mm, one paragraph of in school and the story ended there. But they certainly didn't tell us that the vast majority of people technically falling under this category never agreed to this contract, but were taken unwillingly. We were given the false impression, aka lie, that all these people signed up for this ability to pay for their ship cried across America by working it off a number of years, and technically, this is who should be called an indentured servant. However, this is absolutely not how history played out according to the actual records. Far more often than not, these were not willing participants and only a small fraction of the full number made it to the end alive to receive their allocated land at the end of their term. To give you an idea of the levels, numbers of white human bondage we're talking about, according to the book Boundover, from 1609 until the early 1800s, between one half and two thirds of all the white colonists who came to the new world came as slaves. We were never told that a staggering 20% death rate of these unfortunate souls during their shipping was considered acceptable, and that losing 50% of the cargo to death was not that uncommon, especially when children were involved, and there were often children involved. As an indenture, getting married or having a baby was not allowed, and if a young woman did get pregnant, her contract would be extended by years and her baby would be indentured for 31 years or simply taken from the mother to be sold and never to be seen again. To understand how a dynamic like this could ever happen, we need to know that a significant portion of these people wound up being slaves in the islands like Barbados, as well as colonial Virginia, endured what was called being Barbados, a term to describe political resistors being sold into enslavement, not because they were officially criminals, but were labeled as such because they resisted the takeover of the English government, such as what happened in Ireland with Cromwell. There were also many groups sold into slavery from Britain due to the British Parliament empowering the magistrates to enslave the British poor beyond the seas by labeling them criminals. Slaves came to be made of poor whites who committed the atrocious crimes such as cutting down firewood or poaching a deer from what had been property of the commons. You could be punished into slavery by fishing in an enclosed pond or solemnizing a marriage in secret. An actual example is a father, Thomas Atwood, who for his wife and children crying from starvation had nothing to give them, so he took a sheep to feed them. As a result, he was sold in America as a slave. The end result being for many, being separated from their families and transported to the colonies, often for life. Furthermore, there were also large groups of men, women, and children who were just straight up kidnapped from the British Isles. Some were simply knocked over their heads in the streets, taken drunk out of a pub, or tricked aboard ships from the streets of England. Now you have to realize that the snatching and selling of souls was made possible through not only the invasion of Cromwell into Ireland, but that this along with a virtual industry of enslaving white children was born to fill the needs for running the colonies and was justified within the shadows of a law put into effect by James I. It was called for the due and speedy execution of the statute against rogues, vagabonds, idle, and dissolute persons. This law essentially gave permission to legally entrap or snatch the poor in the British Isles who were simply asking for food, many of whom were poor children with no parents, to then be shipped off into slavery in North America, whose only crime is that they were poor and perhaps happened to be found sleeping in the streets when a constable walked by. This horrendous English trend is actually where the word kidnapped came from. Although today we use it to describe all different ages of persons taken against their will, but it was coined from the term kid nabbed a frequent fate of the poor children on the streets of the British Isles. This reality was certainly perpetuated by the fact that in some cases, up to 50% of the sale of the person went to the local judge and a small percentage went to the king himself. The law contained the phrase, with the power to have their order assigned places and parts beyond the seas onto which such places be Banish. The other side of the story, which we won't go into here, that it was the uh, wealthy aristocrats whose laws put the people into this dire state of poverty in the first place via the theft of the common property of the people. Again, 
banishing them from fishing or hunting on the, the lands which they had always had access to hundreds of years before. But to give you an example of how widespread this kidnapping and selling into servitude was, according to Edward Channing and the History of the United States, there were 10,000 English whites kidnapped for this purpose in one year, 1670, alone. Now do the math for well over 100 years. Yep, whites were slaves too. Even before the first African was brought into America, and when one can scarcely think of whites as slaves, the mind first thinks, well, surely they were treated better, right, than what we hear the black slaves were treated later on. But in the documents, when you dig deep, paint a very different story. Like those found in the records of Middlesex Country, Virginia, whippings were commonplace, as were iron collars and chains. The horrifying treatment was not an uncommon reality of whites in bondage in the colonies, but it was so common, in fact, that the whipping of white slaves resulted in so many being beaten to death that in 1662, the Virginia Assembly passed a law prohibiting the private burial of white slaves because such burials helped to conceal murders by their masters. The colonial records are simply chocked full of the death of white servants by beatings and starvation and exposure, yet you'll find no conviction of the murder of their masters, only innocence, perhaps due in part to the fact that it was only the propertied white class and therefore for whom white slavery was very profitable that were allowed to serve on a jury. White slaves and white servants were forbidden this privilege. Look, this certainly is not a look who suffered contest. I am forced to point out a very deep, dark fact about our nation's history because of this contrived narrative that is today using the lies by the offspring of the same elites that today are causing so many of us to openly hate and persecute each other right now. This omission of our true past is a crime in and of itself. The horrendous story of black slaves, and it was a horrendous story, has been told over and over and over. But the horrendous story of white servitude and slavery has been completely and purposefully hidden. There are even channels and propaganda right now trying to say that if you speak about white slavery, you yourself are a white supremacist. What? Shouldn't it be obvious that admitting to the most humiliating human experience and existence, that of slavery, is about as opposite of supremacist as you can get? Why shouldn't we learn from our horrible mistakes, all of them, of the wrong ways we treated all people? Meanwhile, the tons of Irish slaves brought into America suffered horrible prejudices for many centuries following. Prejudices for simply being Irish, effectively preventing them from getting jobs or housing. Signs like this all over America at that time were not uncommon. Perhaps because the story of white slavery was hidden in the retelling of American history and never told through American media. Perhaps that alone helped the Irish to more easily move on with their lives and so flourish. Again, the psychological damage inflicted upon blacks through perpetuating them as the only slave race this relentless narrative that has been hung over their heads for decades as the victim culture is extremely damaging to them. Shouldn't it be a relief that they're not the only ones? That they, that they could perhaps make them feel not so alone in this measure? But again, that is not what our keepers want. They want to keep only a certain people in the clutches of the psychological slavery that exists in the mind and spirit that is victimhood. And that woman you saw earlier, I think she was Jamaican American. She didn't have it. I'm black, so oppressed. I am black. I'm not oppressed. That's I am for you. free. That's good for you. That's an individual person. What about a systemic issue? Where? I do what I want. You have the skills. This is a country where you have the skills. You want to do what you want. You do it. Stop, stop forcing on people to accept that they're oppressed. They are not. I am not oppressed. I am black. The victimhood narrative is damaging, and it is a lie. It is like having a wound, a deep cut of a wound. And just as it starts to scab over and heal, you rip it off and have to start over with the pain all 
over again, inflicting the trauma over and over with each new story of victimhood, thus preventing the healing from ever happening. If peace is what they wanted, they wouldn't cut the blacks that were standing together with the whites out of the picture. If peace is what they wanted, they wouldn't remind us of the truth of how very long it's been since slavery has been abolished in America. Compared to other countries, hundreds, oh, I think it's 167 countries, in which modern slavery is still a thing today. In this map here, modern slavery, according to the Global Slavery Index, is currently affecting about 48 million people in the world right now where Africa still has some of the highest per capita estimates of slavery with 9.2 million women, men, and children being modern slaves. The thing I can tell you is that America came out of its horrible practices of slavery in a shorter time span than has ever been seen in any country who ever engaged in slave trade. Whereas places like North Africa carried on this heinous tradition for well over 1,400 years and impacted slaves of many colors and again is still suffering with it today. Yet all the media can do is focus on what happened in America 200 years ago. <sighs> Another huge point that if more people knew would stop this white guilt narrative, this white privilege narrative in its tracks. And that is that in 1640, there was not yet any real legal entity of permanent slavery yet. The only durante vita or servitude for life up to that point were the white slaves considered to have no rights because of their accused crimes in the British Isles. Remember when you could be a criminal for taking a rabbit or whatever. So there was no permanent slaves for the blacks being imported at that point until the Georgia Northampton County court records show us that Anthony Johnson sought to legally become the first to own a slave for life in America. Anthony Johnson was black. So the first legally appointed slave for life, a man named John Cassor, happened because Anthony and Mary Johnson, black owners of a tobacco farm in Virginia, fought to win the judicial determination of a slave for life. Wow. One may think when hearing that, well, pff, surely that's an exception. When, in fact, after slavery became a common institution, slave owning by free blacks was so common that in the period of the Commonwealth, it went on unnoticed. I mean, there was no criticism of it. By those who recorded the times, there was abundant proof found in various court records and legislative petitions. According to historian R. Halliburton Jr., there were approximately 320, or say 319, 599 free blacks in the United States. 1830, okay, this is 35 years before slavery was abolished, right? Yet, at the same time, there were 3,775 free blacks who owned 12,740 black slaves. Why weren't we told this in Black History Month? Furthermore, how many times are we told about the awful scene in the Trail of Tears in school? Guys, I remember getting so upset about that. I remember crying about that in school. And yet, how many times did we learn that the Native Americans brought with them through their displacement their black slaves? Oh, I think they left that out. Mm-hmm. Yet, historian Tyra Miles placed the number of enslaved blacks held by Cherokee Nation at around 1,500 black slaves at the time of their westward removal in 1838 through 1839. The Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws, she said, held around 3,500 black slaves across the three nations as the 19th century began. Wow. Wow. And as for the percentage, the real actual world percentage of white families who actually own slaves, which should be taken into deep consideration when we see pictures like this. According to Adam Rothman, a historian at Georgetown University, he was quoted as saying that using census numbers for 1840, the percentage of families owning slaves was 7.4%. To make the slavery in American narrative even more complicated, as it should be, because it is, 
In fact, we know that black and Native Americans also came to own white slaves in Virginia. Yay! Enough so that in 1670, the House of Burgess wrote legislature alluding to this fact. See the slide here. The law, though, apparently was not heeded since 35 years later, it was written also into Virginia's Slave Code of 1705 that reiterated a law indicating that blacks and Native Americans were still owning or purchasing Christians, which was a euphemism for a white person. By recounting and emphasizing again and again and again the sufferings of only black people under slavery, with no mention of the riddled and long history of whites being enslaved, not only in the history of the world, but right here in the good old U.S. of A. The white student of today is made to feel that his ancestors alone were cruel, morally retarded, and evil. They are made to feel that they owe blacks a nearly infinitesimal compensation since they are taught that black people's problems today are the legacy of hundreds of years of slavery for which white people are solely responsible. Yet, the evidence that I have provided with you today offers a mountain of contradiction that is the other side of the story. White students today are taught the lie that the relative prosperity we enjoy today, if we are actually blessed to enjoy it, many of which are not, was achieved largely by the exploitation of black slaves. Is it any wonder that thousands of our young people join Freemason Jesse Jackson in chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's gotta go. Why are you And remember how earlier I talked about all of this being about order out of chaos? Well, even white guilt, this apex of the chaos we see now, was planned over many decades. Evil elitist from a banking lineage, Frederick Lehneman, was a handler to Winston Churchill, and he admitted this according to the personal memoirs of Lord Sherwell when he was quoted as saying, Do you know what the future historians will regard as the most important event of this age? It will not be Hitler and the Second World War. It will not be the release of nuclear energy. It will not be the menace of communism. It will be the abdication of the white man. Jesus said, follow me. He never said, follow Freemason occultists used to divide God's people who by their very nature are antithetical to Christian principles. I've already showed you that it was the mystery religions of Babylon that crept into America from her founding. It is today the same antichrist spirit that has perpetuated the evils that we are all suffering from today. Yet we wrongly teach our children through the media, nothing short of a false history in school, that it was Christianity that was to blame. Is it any wonder that they reject their European heritage who has been through massive amounts of persecution, <coughs> Rome, Inquisition, to turn around and embrace anything, any other culture besides their own? When we know the truth, that it was none other than true Christian culture and principles that pushed slavery into history where it belonged. If more blacks knew that what has done the most to harm them were the lies that they've been programmed to believe through their music, through the media, the lies that money will fulfill them, the lies that women are to be used and throw away, the lies that we've all suffered under believing, that promiscuity is better, that men are always toxic, that women should be dominating men as well as dominating the world. Women, our gift is in our ability to nurture, our empathy, our ability to be flexible and supportive, yet your feminist movement has destroyed you and your family. We're taught that pride and narcissism and love of self is proof of happiness. 
all the while Americans have suffered to some degree under the lies of all these programs, I do believe that blacks have suffered and been targeted far more deeply in this end game that we are all seeing unfold right now with the victim oppressor PSYOP coming to a head so that we will all willingly take part in this civil war 2.0 designed to destroy each other rather than stopping and taking a good long hard look at who's pulling the strings. Our history was written by the victors and for them their ultimate victory of controlling the entire planet through a new world order is not yet in their grasp, but it's close, real close. And for them, this is a winner takes all ending and they're not above using us against each other in order to achieve it. In fact, because we outnumber them by so much, they have to, they have no other choice until they are able to integrate technology into our body itself. It's the only way. And so we choose to tell them to stick their chaos instigating measures used to divide us where the sun don't shine and we choose to love each other. We choose to turn off the news and turn off the media and ignore the celebrities that are selected to deceive us. We choose empathy for the plight of all people of all colors that have been misled by those who consider themselves illumined. Just say no. So that concludes <laughs> my presentation about this. I love you guys. For those of you who have written, emailed, and reached out to me, I am so, so sorry it has been so long. If any of you have emailed what you think was a really important personal message, could you please resend it to me? I hope to have the full piece of America Civil War 2.0 up within four days or so. Thank you so much to those of you who have supported me on Patreon and with your prayers, with your letters and support. I'm sorry I haven't been able to get back to all of you individually, but your concern and care means more to me than you can ever know. God bless you guys. I love you.